I'm Eric Johnson. And I'm a research officer with the Agronomic Crop Imaging Lab at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, it's led by Dr. Steve uh, Shirtliff. And the project that uh, we're working on is looking at novel ways of managing wild oat in wheat. And um, as you know, uh, resistance to herbicides is growing in wild oats in Western Canada. In wheat, we really only have uh, three sites of action or three groups that we can use in wheat, and that would be groups one, two, and 15. And unfortunately, um, we've overused group ones uh, in the past 30 years, and uh, or 30 plus years, and so, you know, we have about 70% of our fields now in where uh, wild oats, uh, there is some resistance to uh, group ones. Uh, group two resistance is also growing. And what's uh, really concerning is that we are seeing uh, an increase in multiple resistance. So resistance to both group ones and twos. So that leaves group 15s. And uh, there is some resistance, but it's certainly not at the same level uh, that we see with group one and group two resistance. So there's a number of uh, components to this project, uh, but today we'll focus on the interrow uh, management of wild oats. And um, we have a fair amount of experience in working with interrow cultivation from our work that uh, we did in organic crop production. And um, we've had quite a bit of success in crops like, uh, in pulse crops in particular, uh, with mechanical weed control. Uh, we hadn't really looked at it in cereals, but we have now, uh, we're now looking at it in both oats and wheat. Uh, we had a graduate student, uh, Alex Alba, and he worked on interrow cultivation and uh, uh, post-emergence uh, rotary hoeing. And uh, he actually has a YouTube channel and he shows some results um, uh, from that work. So uh, we, we had a pretty good feeling for that uh, inter-row uh, cultivation uh, could show some positive results. Um, the other thing that we had less experience with, but uh, work that Chris Willenberg had initiated in pulse crops with uh, inter-row spraying um, of non-selective herbicides, so products like uh, glyphosate or glufosinate, uh, Liberty, uh, spraying between the crop rows with a uh, specialized shrouded sprayer. Um, uh, we wanted to see if that had any potential as well to, um, to manage uh, wild oats. One of the limitations uh, with interrow weed management, be it uh, cultivation or uh, interrow spraying, is that uh, we don't control weeds within the row. And uh, in the work that was done by Alex, uh, we were able to do uh, control some of the uh, annual broadleaf weeds uh, within the row using uh, post-emergence rotary hoeing, but uh, rotary hoeing is not effective on large seeded wild oats. It's only effective, effective on uh, mostly small seeded uh, broadleaf weeds. So uh, what we did was uh, we thought we would look to see what the results would be if we integrated it with the uh, uh, seeding rate and uh, a pre-emergence application of a soil active herbicide. So we used uh, triolate. So the treatments were triolate versus no triolate. We had three seeding rates of 150, 300, and 450 seeds per square meter. And then uh, that was also, th uh, the third factor then was of course, no interrow weed management, interrow cultivation, and interrow spraying. And the herbicide that we used uh, we used glyphosate to begin with, but uh, we, uh, last year and this year, we decided to use glyphosinate uh, because uh, you know, we're always concerned about uh, uh, selecting for glyphosate resistance in, in wild oats, so we thought we'd use uh, a different herbicide. Uh, and we typically apply uh, the intero treatments somewhere between the four and five leaf stage in that particular study. We do have 
another study where we're looking at application timing of the intero um, non-selective herbicides and we're looking at two to three um, and uh, four to five leaf stages. Uh, you need a, a little bit of growth there so you can, uh, so the shrouds can uh, go between the rows. Uh, you can't go at the two leaf stage, but you can go about the three or four leaf stage uh, with it uh, and get reasonably good results. So in terms of the preliminary results, we don't have yield data. We'll be harvesting, well, we've harvested one of the trials, but uh, we don't have the yield data yet. And uh, we'll be harvesting the second trial today, actually. Um, but in terms of uh, wild oat management, uh, the biggest um, reduction in wild oat biomass comes from the trilate application. Uh, you know, we get a 70 to 80 percent reduction in uh, wild oat biomass, so it's still quite effective. We apply uh, granular uh, trilate in the fall, and we do uh, a shallow incorporation with a harrowing after that. Um, in terms of seeding rate, um, increasing the seeding rate from 150 to 450 seeds per square meter. If you look at it in isolation, it, uh, it reduces weed biomass by as much as 50%. And um, the intero treatments is a little more, are, are a little more variable, but generally we'll get 40 to 50% reduction in wild oak biomass. Now, when we combine the three, we get 95 to 98% reduction in wild oak biomass. So for reducing wild oak biomass, we're also uh, reducing wild oat seed production as well. Um, in terms of yield, um, I, we have one year of really good data and most of the yield benefit, because most of the wild oats biomass reduction comes from the trilate application. And uh, we see a, a smaller uh, yield increase from the um, uh, seeding rate and we don't see a lot of benefits to going higher than 300 seeds per square meter in terms of yield. Um, there are some benefits in terms of, you know, causing a marginal reduction in, in wild oat biomass, but I think 300 seeds per square meter for most growers would be adequate. Um, and in terms of the inter-row application by itself, we don't see a huge yield benefit because we're not controlling the weeds uh, between rows. I think if I was to look uh, further investigate this though, I'd look just uh, strictly at the interaction with seeding rate and, uh, um, and uh, the inter-row uh, weed management because uh, uh, perhaps those two factors together uh, would show yield benefits if you, if you if you, let's say, had resistance to trilate as well. This is a stirrable intero cultivator. I'll talk more about it later. Uh, but we also uh, mount this uh, intero sprayer on the back of the cultivator so we can uh, manually steer between the rows. Now, uh, the commercial equipment uses uh, camera guidance to, um, to keep the uh, shovels between the rows or the shrouds between the rows. So this is our shrouded sprayer and um, these shrouds are made by Garford. Uh, so we got them, it's a European co uh, company. Now the uh, Garford intero sprayer is a bit more elaborate than this. So it has guide wheels in front of the shrouds and it also has row covers to provide extra protection but so far this has worked reasonably well in uh, protecting the crop rows. We get a little bit of damage um, but most of it's uh, related to our driving perhaps um, and uh, we've been able to reduce uh, drift for the most part. So when we started with these shrouds uh, we took a 65 degree flat fan nozzle and we turned it sideways to, to work in the shrouds. So if we used a normal uh, flat fan nozzle, of course, we'd get a whole bunch of spray on the edge of the shrouds. And one of the things we found with that, because a flat fan nozzle um, 
it uh, produces kind of an elliptical spray pattern. So we weren't getting really good coverage. And so I did find banding nozzles that I installed and we get a nice uniform band across the 20 centimeters. So we spray um, a band eight inches wide between the rows or 20 centimeters and we seed at 12 inch row spacing um, and uh, so 30 centimeters. So, uh, and it's the same with the inter-row cultivation. Uh, we, cult we can cultivate between uh, 12 inch row spacing uh, uh, quite easily. Some of the challenges we've had with this is um, these shrouds will dig into residue and then pop up. And then if that's the case, then you're gonna get drift uh, or rocks. So we pretty well had to uh, use a roller on a lot of our trowels to, to level out the plots. Uh, I'm sure some of that could be overcome by engineering, but that's, that's been one of the challenges. Um, I think we've uh, kind of got the plumbing and the uh, nozzle selection and that figured out. Uh, we can't, uh, because they're so, such so, uh, small plots, uh, we apply all our uh, herbicides in 200 liters of uh, carrier volume or 20 gallons per acre. And the reason we do that is just uh, if we were to go to uh, 10 gallons or less, we would have to um, go just too fast. Uh, we, we travel at about uh, four and a half kilometers an hour. So the intero cultivator, we've had quite a few years. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we did a lot of work in organic production with it. Um, we have a seat on there that a technician can sit and steer between the crop rows. Um, we can keep it fairly, uh, we can do a pretty good job of uh, keeping it between the crop rows just with GPS, but just for some, if there's some, a little bit of, uh, shift in the rows somewhere, we can adjust for that by steering. So we can also do that when we do uh, the inter-row spraying as well. Uh, the cultivator actually works reasonably well. There's just uh, uh, small shovels, so um, we can uh, adjust the depth of cultivation. Um, I was always, I was concerned about crop residue because um, in our organic trials, of course, there's a lot of preceding tillage, so we, we didn't have much crop residue. Uh, and uh, we've been using this uh, in direct seeded systems. I'm not sure how well it would work in uh, long-term zero-till fields where people had high levels of crop residue. You might get uh, you know, covering of the crop rows, which you don't want. But uh, actually it's, it's worked uh, reasonably well in both oats and wheat, uh, as well as pulse crops. The organic growers that use it um, Typically, though, we'll use it in more their, their highest value crops, which would be pulses and their, their less competitive crops. So the, the, the major use of these is to, um, is not your primary method of weed control, but uh, using them in a way to uh, take care of residual weeds after other practices have failed. So to get that last 10 or 15% that can produce seed and, uh, and cause you problems in future years. So um, this is a trial where we're just looking at different non-selective herbicides and uh, different timings of uh, non-selective herbicides applied between the crop rows of wheat. Um, so we have a, a timing of about the three to four leaf stage and then a timing uh, at the five to six leaf stage of the wheat. And um, we have uh, five different non-selective herbicides, uh, glyphosate, glufosinate, um, different, uh, different rates of glyphosate. And then uh, we also just uh, included a treatment this year with an experimental compound called tiafenacil, which is a group 14 and uh, it seems to have some synergism with uh, glufosinate and it actually worked quite well in this uh, trial. So this is a guard plot. Um, we seeded oats to make sure we had it uh, 
enough uh, weeds in here. Uh, we don't have a high inherent population of wild oats right here. Um, so you can see um, this guard plot has had no treatments and uh, there's, there's quite a bit of oats uh, present. Um, this is uh, an early application. Uh, you can see we pretty well controlled the weeds between the crop rows, but we have um, still have oats present uh, within the crop row. So that's why we've initiated the other study uh, where we're looking at integrating it with other management practices. Now this particular treatment in this uh, replicate worked extremely well. So this was a later application of glyphosate uh, applied between the crop rows. And uh, uh, it seems like we got reasonably good uh, uh, control um, and uh, the uh, oat growth within the crop row uh, isn't, uh, isn't as bad as it is uh, with the earlier application. In this uh, treatment here, it's kind of would be our check plot, the lowest seeding rate, uh, no triolate uh, applied, and no uh, inter-row uh, application. So you can see uh, some fairly high densities uh, of wild oat, um, and that's certainly going to have a negative impact on yield and also uh, the amount of wild oat seed chattering that's been going on here will contribute to you know, wild oat populations in the future. So this particular plot is uh, uh, similar to the check plot in terms of the seeding rate is uh, low at 150 seeds per square meter. Um, but we've also added triolate in the fall and uh, we've applied glufosinate into row. So we're getting probably well over 80% control, but we're still getting a few residual wild oats in these plots, so not uh, complete control. So this particular plot then, now we've integrated all three factors. We have the highest seeding rate, 450 seeds per square meter. We've applied triolate in the fall, and we've also applied glufosinate into row. And you can see we pretty well have 100% control of the wild oats. So a very clean plot. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 300 seeds per square meter uh, seems to be adequate. There may be some benefits to going to a higher seeding rate if your wild oat densities by populations are really high. Um, but uh, I think in, in a lot of cases, uh, 300 is adequate provided you're using some other control measures for your uh, for your wild oats. So this is the fa final year of the project and we'll be uh, preparing a final report that will uh, be available on the Sasquatch uh, website sometime within the next year or so. Um, if you're looking for more information on managing wild oat, uh, I suggest you check out the Resistant Wild Oat Action Committee. Uh, we are active on Twitter and we also uh, have a page on the Canadian Weed Science Society website. So if you uh, Google Canadian Weed Science Society and uh, you can find uh, some infographics and some videos that we've produced on managing uh, wild oats. So you just look uh, for the uh, Resistant Wild Oat Action Committee tab uh, under the Canadian Weed Science Society website.